Okay, well, welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get going. Um, and I wanna just introduce myself and my organization and welcome you. Uh, my name is Amy Blackshaw. I'm the Behavioral Health Project Director at the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are so glad um, that you're joining us today as we deepen our knowledge about school-based peer-to-peer support programs. Peer-to-peer -peer programs are a meaningful strategy to support student well-being, to build connection, safety, and belonging on school campuses, and are really an opportunity to center youth, youth experience, and the untapped power of peer relationships. We're extremely excited to be talking about um, peer programs right now. It's an exciting time. Many of you are aware that the state is rolling out the California Youth or the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, which really aims to reimagine and transform the way that we support the wellness of children and youth by ensuring that the supports are available to them when and where and in the way that children and youth need it most. So peer-to-peer -peer programs are really part of this shift that builds on prevention, on early intervention, that builds cultural relevance, and is really focused on social and emotional skill building that can support um, youth to thrive. So I'm really excited about peer-to-peer -peer programs because it is really allowing us to think more broadly about what supports children and youth mental wellness. At the end of today's webinar, I'm gonna let you know about a funding opportunity to support peer-to-peer -peer programs that's just coming out. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I'm going to try to go to the next slide here. Yeah, so before we dive in, I'm just gonna go over some logistics. Uh, we are recording this webinar and the recording, the slides will be shared out to you. I uh, will also be posting them on our website in the next couple of days. Um, for those of you who you know, might not be able to stay for the whole time, just know that you will get those materials afterwards. We do have the, the Q&A um, enabled, so feel free to use that to put your questions there. We will have time at the end to answer questions or possibly during the presentation if it's really relevant to what we're talking about. Um, you can also feel free to use the chat to respond, to add your comments, your thoughts in the chat. That's all fine. Your interaction is welcome. Um, but just know that we will do some Q&A at the end. Um, and so we are the California School-Based Health Alliance. And our organization's mission is really to improve the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing school health services. So we really believe that healthcare needs to be accessible and at and where kids are. So schools, um, we wanna support schools to have the services needed that remove barriers to learning and that enhance equity. So really what we do is to help support the growth and best practices of school-based health centers, wellness centers, and school health programs. And a big part of that work is gathering school and health professionals, organizing convenings and webinars like this one, supporting and disseminating expertise in the field and best practices and models of care that we see to be having a really positive and meaningful impact. So that is why we are here today to lift up peer-to-peer -peer programs. Um, we have lots and lots of resources on our website, so I encourage you to take a look. We have toolkits and information and webinar recordings from past offerings that we've had, so um, feel free to check it out, and the, the website is linked in the chat. We also convene an annual conference, and this year it's going to be in April. Um, it's a two-day conference in Santa Clara building transformational school health for California's future. We hope that all of you will be interested in attending. Um, we do, we've just opened our registration and so you can get that information that um, we're putting in the chat for you. Um, we have an early bird registration, so it's, it's more affordable to register early. 
there's going to be lots of really meaningful workshops and speakers related to how we can transform and rethink and um, enhance school health services. Um, and, you know, CSHA, the California School-Based Health Alliance, we are a member organization, which um, means that we offer some additional benefits for our members. Most everything that you'll find on our website is just available to anyone. Um, but we do offer some resources for members. So we encourage that, especially if you're interested in coming to the conference, because we give a very big discount for our members. Um, and if, especially if you're coming with a group from your organization, it's really cost effective to become members and then register for our conference. Um, so that information is being shared with you as well. Um, and now I want to introduce today's speaker. We're really privileged to have Hillary Roberts here with us today. She has deep and vast experience in the area of peer-to-peer -peer programs. So we're really happy to have her here to share her, her expertise with our community of school health champions. So Hillary background, she was a teacher in the classroom 35 years. Um, she trains individuals, groups, schools, universities, and organizations to build capacity around peer programming and conflict resolution, restorative practices, and diversity and inclusion awareness. She served for nearly 20 years as the peer resources coordinator at the Fremont Unified School District, where she developed curriculum, implemented programs, trained youth to counsel other youth, and trained youth to present peer education, do conflict mediation, restorative justice, restorative practices work. Um, and now she currently works with many agencies, districts, site administrators, youth and teachers and counselors to really rethink and reshape their personal and organizational culture, communication skills and disciplinary practices for more balanced and peaceable outcomes. She's also the founder and executive director of Peer Advocates Training and Consulting. Um, the book that she wrote, Peer Advocates in Action, is an adopted textbook for many peer support programs throughout California. So there's much more that I haven't mentioned about Hillary's background, but I don't wanna take any more time um, away from her time. So with that, I'm gonna welcome our presenter, Hillary Roberts. Thank you, Amy. And um, I think you've said it all. The only uh, thing I want to add is that many of you may have known or know Ira Sacknoff, and he was the father of peer programs. Now he's the grandfather of peer programs. He was my mentor back in the late 90s when I developed the program at Kenning High School in Fremont. And, um, and then I began training with him and then for him. And when I left teaching in 2014, after 35 years of high school teaching, I um, uh, I began my, I started my own organization. And so um, he has, he was a great mentor and I don't want to leave him out of this because he's inspired so much. He started the San Francisco Peer Resources Program in, um, and we were every school in, in uh, San Francisco unified, all the high schools have peer program. So um, go ahead and let's turn to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna give you lots of information today and on how to develop a peer program. It's a general overview and I'm gonna my, give you my information, my um, email and my website, which will be on the last slide so that you can contact me if we don't get a chance to answer any of your questions today, or if any of your questions are particular to your site or your program, if you have a CBO, a community-based organization, things like that. So, but this is a general overview of peer program development. So there are two elements of a peer program. And the first one is what are something I call the building blocks. It's the foundational pieces. Before you even begin a program, these are the kinds of things you need to have in place. And yes, this is youth to youth work where you want youth to have input into it, but you need some kind of foundational piece of what your goals and objectives are. So you need to have a needs assessment 
And that's not just why you as the adult in the room have an, the needs for what you think appear the, the school or the CBO needs. You also have to have a needs assessment of what your youth need. You also want to have a purpose and a mission statement, kind of like your elevator speech that you can talk about and speak about very quickly about this is what our mission and goals are, are your goals and objectives, staffing, you have to decide who's staffing the program. Staffing takes very specific skills. Somebody with a, a big heart, who's very well organized, who, um, who uh, sorry about that, somebody who's very well organized and who has good relationships with youth, but also good boundaries. And um, very important is you need to get administrative and faculty support. Without administrative and faculty support, your program can fall apart. Absolutely. So there has to be, the site really wants to have this kind of program. You also are going, we're going to take a look at some of these things today. What are your service options? We'll look at some of those in, in a little bit. What are your policies and procedures? Um, you would want a community and advisory committee. They're not your bosses. They're just people who will be advising you, who will support you. Um, you want to be able to evaluate your program and where is your funding coming from? That is the basics. That's the first element. These are all foundational pieces before you even dive into bringing on youth. So let's go ahead to the, to the next slide, please. And so the second foundation, the second part is what I call the nuts and bolts of a successful peer resource program. This is the recruitment of students. How many students are you going to recruit? And in this case, in any kind of public education or in any situation, you want to recruit as many students as possible. Of course, I had a program that ran for nearly 20 years. So we were recruiting hundreds of students in a high school of, of 13 or 1400 students. However, selection is a different story. Who are you selecting? What kind of student are you selecting? What you want is you want students who have, who have good attendance, who will be available, who aren't overwhelmed by how much they have to do in their lives. These are not youth who want this on their, on their applications for college just because to get into college. You want youth who have really cared deeply enough about others. And I'll go over that a little bit more. You also have to select a curriculum. Um, I will, uh, I did write a curriculum as a 22 year old high school teacher in New York City. I had wished that I somebody would have handed me a curriculum from day one that was exactly, you know, exactly, um, you know, what the lesson plans would have looked like when I was in school to become a teacher. So um, what I did was I wrote a curriculum and I, if you can see that, and I'll, I'll uh, shamelessly advocating for it, it's called Peer Advocates in action and actually it's you can purchase it on amazon and i'll i'll share that link later um when are you going to train is another part where are you training that's another piece of what you have to decide upon for for your program how are you going to supervise your students if you have a a program where you can only meet one hour a week or if you have a class now i had the Cadillac of programs. I had a class. So, um, you know, I had them every day when it was a full year program, an hour a day. And when it was a four by four block schedule, I had them an hour and a half a day for half a year. But then I had supervision with them during an advisory period. So I kind of had even when they weren't in the class. So I kind of had this Cadillac of programs. But you have to think about when will you supervise your students? What kind of records are you going to be keeping? Okay, because and for whom is this going to be a funded program? You also want to keep records so that you have information and data to put out to staff and to other people at your sites. And of course, how are you going to recognize and celebrate your students? What will they earn at the end of their training that will allow them to do the work that you want them to do? So the um, so these are all things that are really important. So Let's go ahead and let's take a look at the next slide. I'm 
a firm believer, and if we take a look at these titles across the top, children's needs met by families, this is what we hope for, or this is what we see, children's needs being met by gangs and children's needs being met by schools. And if you look at the children's needs met by families, what, what you would hope for is that there's acceptance, there's love, there's a sense of power, empowerment, there's a sense of identity and belonging, the affiliation, feeling of respect, friends, rewards, loyalty, trust, rites of passage, and fun. And of course, many young people join gangs for, see the list, exactly the same reasons. I believe, and not just believe, but I have seen that children's needs can be met by schools in something like a peer program. I have seen it for 20 years. Acceptance, love, power, belonging to something bigger than themselves, identity, affiliation, a sense of respect, friendships with people they didn't even think they could ever be friends with, rewards for just doing really important peer-to-peer -peer work, a sense of loyalty and trust, rites of passage and fun. So we can move that on, please. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background about peer program de definitions and what we're looking at here today. And Delaine Easton, who was the California Superintendent of Public Education and also ran for governor, she was a great proponent for peer programming. And one of her things was Another avenue for developing positive youth leadership is peer resource programs in which students are given ongoing opportunities to be resources to each other. Programs such as peer tutoring, cooperative learning, cross-age tutoring, peer helping and peer mediation provide opportunities for young people to connect, to develop skills, to promote positive change, and to feel a sense of pride as they learn that they can make a difference in the real world. The next quote is by Bonnie Bernard, who is steeped in peer programming research and, and experience. Uh, if you look her up, she's quite amazing. And she, her focus on peer programs, she has seen real live work from these youth. And she says, clearly based on the rationales that in included the importance of peers and social development, the need for youth in our society to have more available social support and more opportunities to participate and help, the need for every individual to be socialized to accept and respect diversity, the value of learning collaboration and conflict resolution skills from an early age, and the proven positive academic and social outcomes of evaluated cooperative and peer learning and resource programs Peer programs do indeed offer us a lodestone to developing health and well being in our children and youth and hence in our society. And lodestone is a, it means it's a source, a positive source for developing health and well being in our children and youth and hence in our society. So these are just a couple of reflections on peer programs. So we can go to the next slide. Let's take a look at some of the data. And if you would like more of the data, I can get that to you as well through um, through Amy and her work. I can, or you can contact me. But this is some of the data that came up. And by the way, all the pictures in here of my last year teaching, my 2013-14 school year, they are my peer program at Kennedy High School in Fremont. So um, those are the those are the faces of the beautiful young people I had the privilege and pleasure of working with. So an, um, the glimpse of, a glimpse of peer helping research, a meta-analysis of 120 studies show that interactive peer-led programs conducted with children in grades seven through nine are significantly better than teacher-led programs in preventing tobacco, alcohol, and other substance use. I saw my youth who were former drug users, some of them, or current, you know, um, students, students who were smoking weed and doing all that kind of thing, going into the ninth grade health classes because the teachers brought them in and running a panel about how, how drugs and alcohol and other substances impacted their lives. 
And it was more effective. And even though we had great health teachers, it was more effective in making an impact on young people. The second, the second data point, the Search Institute indicated that youth grades six through 12 that engaged in projects and programs to help others on a weekly basis are less likely to report at-risk behavior. Third point, Peer-led refusal and resistance skills for children and adolescents appear to be highly effective across cultural contexts and settings and appear more efficacious than teacher-led refusal and resistance skills. So it doesn't matter your population. It doesn't matter. It, it's across all cultural contexts, all social identities. It's just more efficacious than teacher-led refusal and resistance skills. The next point, school referrals to the office for fighting were reduced 50% in middle school because of conflict resolutions peer programs. And by the way, we saw the same thing when I trained my youth. I'm, I'm, I'm a certified conflict mediator. I'm a sort of justice practitioner. I'm a trauma resiliency coach. Um, I, you know, I've done all this different kind of work. And so I, anything that I learned, I trained up my youth. And they went ahead and did this work. They ran circles. They did all kinds of things. Mediation. They did um, a mindfulness work to help people calm down their central nervous systems. And we found there was a reduction in conflicts and referrals to the office because of the conflict mediation program. And also because of the peer program, because it intervened before a conflict happened. The next point in an analysis of 143 adolescent drug prevention programs, it was clearly found that peer programs are dramatically more effective in decreasing drug use than all the other programs, even at the lowest level of intensity. So let's move that on, please, to the next slide. And I know this is a lot of reading, but I want you to notice as you're looking at this, at the differences in these, um, at the differences to be able to um, the different um, definitions. So California Association of Peer Programs doesn't exist anymore. It's too bad. It's CAP. They used to have fantastic conferences where they had youth come and present and, um, and attend all different kinds of programs. And they define peer programs as Peer helping provides understanding, support, prevention, intervention, and referral services to individuals and groups by utilizing the human resources of peers trained in communication, decision-making, self-awareness, and helping skills. Individuals, especially youth trained in peer helping skills, can and do make a significant contribution to their peers and to the welfare of our society. The National Peer Helpers Association added a little bit, something a little different, if you'll notice. Um, and they say, peer helping is a variety of supportive services initiated by peers in diverse settings. Sometimes students just need someone to listen to their problems and to help sort out the options open to them. Peer helpers are good listeners and are skilled in the difficult task of helping others to solve their own problems. Hence, I'm sorry, their own problems rather than solving problems for them. Although they assume different roles, peer helpers are not used in place of licensed or certified health profession professionals or as mental health practitioners. They often serve as referral sources for students who need professional help. Peer helpers provide peers with opportunities for learning, guidance, emotional support, and growth by helping others, they often increase their own self-esteem and personal functioning. So as you see there, they've added in this component of they're not, this group didn't want to be seen and we're peer counselors. Like, you know, who are these kids coming up and, you know, people go to school to become counselors or MSWs or, you know, clinical psychologists and they come out and after a year of training, they're suddenly peer counselors. So they, this group wanted to make it clear that that wasn't the role of their students involved in this program. And then in fact, they were more of a referral service. But I do want to say youth can be trained up to do both. They can be you trained up to be both a peer counselor and a referral service, which is what my students, that was my background in mental health, lent itself to um, 
definitely have my kids doing some mental health um, support work. And then San Francisco Peer Resources, and this is what I, the organization Ira Sacknoff started 40 years ago. Um, San Francisco Peer Resource Programs operate under the philosophy that everyone has something valuable to offer and that students can serve as resources for one another. At the heart of this philosophy is the belief that students can be empowered to act as advocates, educators, and counselors for their peers. So these are just some definitions to get an idea if you're wondering about what are peer programs, how do we define that? So let's go on to the next slide. This is my working definition, and these are my beautiful young people. <laughs> um, and the thing about peer programs, it's a dual program. This is my working definition. I hope it's our working definition. A quality peer program trains youth in very specific communication and helping skills. So that's on one hand, who, who will then use those skills in a systematic, well thought out way to provide services to other youth. This is a dual purpose, okay? You can have a program where your students are so well trained and I've worked with programs like this in, in supporting them, but the focus on what they were going to be doing wasn't there and there was no staff or administrative support. So you can imagine what happens in a program like that where students are well trained, but there's no focus or no entry into what they will be doing at, this, at the site, that's going to fall apart. I've also worked with groups where the students were poorly trained and then were asked to go out and do incredible work like peer counseling when they only had a, an eight hour training in kind of how to clear your lens and your, and, and, uh, your communication skills. So people rise to the level of their training. So depending upon what you are looking for at your site, you really have to have both, okay? I can only give a weekend of training to my youth. Well, then you don't want them to be doing peer counseling, right? So that kind of thing. But you may have them doing peer education. And that could, that could be something also. So just remember, this is the definition. It's, it's dual train them up really well and send them out to do very specific work. Okay, let's move on. So these are the kinds of different kinds of programs that um, you are possible for you. And given my background in, um, in uh, I worked in mental health in New York City. I worked with teens and adults who had serious um, mental health issues. I worked in schools and in uh, group home situations over the years. And so I had that background, but these are some parts. So I, I chose very specific things that were work well for me, but these are some specific projects and programs you might want to do at your sites. You might want to do an orientation transition assistance programs, which is, is new students adjusting to a you know school kids coming in, even after the first day of school. Young, you know, youth are uncomfortable coming in after the school year has started. Many of them, they often transfer schools for difficult reasons. So do you have, do you want to help new and transfer students adjust to school through personal tours, one-on-one -on -one transition partnerships, class presentations, things like that. Peer education, which I recommend for everybody. And these are, this is where students develop and lead class presentations or school-wide activities on subjects that impact their peers. And this could be on racism, bullying, sexting, depression, and refusal skills, decision-making, anything. But I really encourage you to think about peer education as any component of, of, component of any peer program. Peer counseling, this is again, this is something we talked about where you have one-on-one -on -one contacts to assist or refer when necessary. And it can be um, pre, pre-arranged sessions, drop-in basis, anything like that. And that this would be definitely be something where you'd keep a record of, of what the youth are doing and who they're supporting. Conflict mediation, another thing that you may want your students to be doing. Okay, mediating issues between students. An English language learners discussion group, any kind of new working and safe discussion groups with immigrant or refugee peers, helping them learn about the new culture, practice any English skills, make connections, um, helping people assimilate and also celebrate their own culture. 
buddy connection, matching older students with younger students at middle schools and things like that. Um, or middle school students going to the lower grades or to elementary schools. You can have something where you have support groups where students lead or co-lead support groups on specific or general topics. So it could be drop-in or informal groups at lunchtime, could be children of alcoholics, could be you know smokers, refugee youth, um, you know, um, groups that focus on LGBTQI plus issues, anything like that. Um, also tutoring, it also are going to have students who, who can tutor other students. And by the way, the very basic skills to support all of these are the same. And then these, these programs would be put on top of those. I'll explain more of that later. Of course, restorative practice facilitators. Um, my students were trained up as, um, as circle keepers and um, worked they didn't do a uh, harm and healing circles, but they did do community building circles. Although I work with schools that where the students are working with co-leading harm and healing circles, just have to know what your liability issues are for that kind of information. And then brief intervention, which is a, a harm reduction uh, drug program, also trained in brief intervention. And that's being piloted right now in Antioch, California at Antioch High School by amazing teacher there, Shira Schweitzer, and it's uh, Contra Costa County is, is piloting it. Those of you who know about this program, I always believe youth could do it. They're piloting it, so stay tuned. Um, it's not yet been approved, but I believe that they can do the step-by-step -step brief intervention work if you know anything about it. I and mean, if you don't, I encourage you to, to take a look into BI, um, and Ira Sacknoff runs those trainings. So these are some ideas for programs or projects. And let's go ahead and, and turn the page there. So <laughs> I always smile when I see these pictures because uh, <laughs> lying on the ground with my kids. So <laughs> um, anyway, this is the these are some ideas for um, the training modules. Of course, it could be a class during the school day if for credit. And then it's A through G, those of you who know schools, a through G is possible. That's a G, a G. These are mean that it's CSU and, and state university accredited electives. So that, um, and if you're interested in getting information about A through G approval, I have tons of information. I don't want, I don't want to be cremated with this stuff. I want to give it away. I want you all to do better. I want you to have it. So if you write to me, I will send you anything you need. Happy to help you. So you can have it as class during the school day. That is ideal. That is absolutely ideal. It can be a pullout activity. If you're a, a community-based organization going into a school and you're meeting with a group of youth for an hour a week or, or zero period before the day starts or the end of the day, okay? Um, what you want to be clear about, though, is no matter what you choose to do in terms of your training model, you always think about who will be excluded. So I really encourage you to think who gets excluded if it's after school, who gets excluded if it's before school, especially like middle school kids um, who, who depend on, always depending on parent um, uh, or bus for transportation. So, um, so then pull out activity and then before school activity, I've worked with some great programs in the state of California where um, somebody ran a two, um, two one hour sessions before school and then had the kids do amazing work throughout the school year. A lunch activity, many people go that route because they don't have other options. Of course, it's not advisable, you know, we get 35 minutes for lunch and, you know, in most schools or if you have, um, and of course I'm, I'm teaching through, a, I'm talking through a school lens. I know many of you are probably through other kinds of organizations. Um, but, you know, it, that's very difficult lunch. They get their lunch, they're not focused, things like that. After school activity and evening activity where you train up youth in the evening. Could it be a weekend activity where you're training up youth to do the work throughout the school year and you're going to supervise them? Is it a retreat training? I, I trained up a group of youth for one school. We did a week-long summer program. Um, where they got trained up and the work that they did during the school year was phenomenal around peer education and running circles, things like that. 
an adult school class, an ROP class, regional occupational program class, a summer camp program, which is what I did. And if there's any others that you are thinking about, how, what kind of model will you have? So go ahead and let's go to the next one, please. So please steal this bar or borrow it long-term. I don't want it back, but I stole this from somebody. But if you want to get the word out, what sort of youth are you looking for to do peer advocacy work? And I call them peer advocates. You're going to hear all kinds of names. In Marin County, there's SWAP Ambassador Student Wellness uh, Ambassador Program. At other places, they're, um, they're PLUS Peer Leaders Uniting Students. That's all through Stockton Unified. There's so many different names. I happen to call my program peer resources and call my kids peer advocates. So this is what I used and what I stole from somebody years, 30 years ago. Are you big enough to be a peer advocate? Do you have a heart big enough to feel for more than just yourself and your friends, but also for others in need? Do you have a heart and mind big enough to understand more than just your own feelings, but how someone outside your group might feel? Do you have the ability to listen to all sides of a problem without giving advice and just be there for someone who needs you just to listen? Are you strong enough to keep what you hear and see to yourself when you are helping someone to never gossip about or put someone down that you are to help? Do you want to be part of a school that feels safe to all students, no matter who they are? If you think you are a big enough person to do these things, then we need you to be a peer advocate. And these were flyers that went out all over school. This is the kind of thing you can post. This is the kind of thing you can do on the public address system. All these things to find, because we're talking about recruiting students. And remember, it's different than selection. You want to recruit as many students and students who fit this. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. So, so here are some recruitment methods. Remember, it's not selection. We're talking about how do you recruit students. And remember, you want to recruit students who are anybody, anybody who's interested. So, and if you find that you are not getting enough of students of a, a particular group, you may want to go out and actually say, I'm looking for students to come and interview or fill out applications or whatever the process is for you to select your students. So how will you recruit students? Here are some possibilities. Ask for recommendations from teachers, counselors, and administrators. I also encourage you to ask the front office staff who are, or the, or the, um, or the, uh, the registrar because you'll, you'll find the registrar is almost the first point of contact when kids come, if they speak different languages, if they're coming from other countries, if they're moving into a community from another, another site, from another, another school district or another community. Um, and the front office staff will absolutely know kids who have good attendance who are there, who, who are showing up. Make formal class presentations and if possible, include current peer helpers in the presentation. And that can even be a video. Recruiting your school newspaper over the PA system and on posters throughout the school. And elicit recommendations from students. Many schools ask students to complete a survey um, naming students that will talk if they, uh, they would talk to if they had problem or students they perceive as positive student leaders. The students whose names appear most often are then invited to interview for the peer assistance program. So with my teacher lens, I will tell you there are specific groups of teachers that see parallel play in their classrooms. And I'm not talking little kids, I'm talking in middle school and high school. These, these teachers that, and parallel play, and the reason I bring that up is because they're sitting next to each other and they're interacting and they're reach over and help each other. And that will be your music programs, that will be your art teachers, that will be your PE teachers, that will be your chemistry teachers, kids sitting around the same, the same group, you always want to remember that you want, you want, this is just recruitment. Okay. We're not talking selection yet. This is recruit everybody. And like I said, if you cannot get students are not represented by the groups they're in, you want to reach out and ask for those groups. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
So selection. So these are some of the things you may wanna look at when you're selecting students. And I'm gonna go more in depth about this. So when selecting peer advocates, you may wanna look for the following. Demonstrated behavior that is caring, accepting, genuine understanding and trustworthy. An understanding and acceptance of the responsibilities and limitations of the peer helper's role. Okay, they're gonna earn some kind of badge and you'll see in some of these pictures, some of the students are wearing bright pink badges. That's what they earn um, when, they, when they finish the peer program. That was their certification and they went out. But they had to understand, they also had access to pulling kids out of class. They had to understand the, the responsibilities and limitations. You just can't pull kids out of class. The ability to be sensitive to students from diverse backgrounds. The time to devote to training and projects. The ability to serve as a positive role model, the willingness to seek and accept adult supervision. You want a diverse population of students. I will say a few things that are not on this list. You want as diverse a, a population of students, you want them to be a microcosm of your school. And so things that, this is why I ask you, because you will be surprised. Sometimes what educators see as, as ability to serve as a positive role model. What does that mean to be a positive role model? For whom, right? It may be a kid who doesn't, who is not doing so well in their classes, but boy, you know, has a way of interacting with other people and support, right? You definitely want to racially, ethnically, um, uh, sexual identity and gender identity, diverse group. You want cultural differences. You want that you really want to make the kids. What you don't want are the kids who are involved in everything. So this wouldn't necessarily be. I will tell you, in twenty years, I took only two kids who were in, who were in the top ten of the graduating class. Um, and you want, of course, students who are not going to graduate because if you train them up, you maybe want one or two students who are graduating the next that year because you want students who will stay and build capacity and be part of the fabric of the school. You definitely want, and then, but I want to also say this, when you are selecting your peers, you also want students who can give more help than they need. Okay, definitely you want, this is, and also this is not, um, this is not therapy, this program, but it is therapeutic for youth, very therapeutic. Um, again, you want youth who can give more help than they need. So um, let's go ahead and, I'm sure please gather your questions and comments for later. We'll have time at the end um, for everyone to pitch in. I really want to hear from you. Um, so how do you, so like I said, your program will die if you don't get administrative and faculty support. Okay, so this is how to get some support. So while a peer program is a youth to youth support program, Please ask administration and staff for programs, ideas, and suggestions. I remind the staff, this is a youth to youth program. What do you think the youth need? I know what you need, okay? Um, so what do, you, what, what do you think the youth need, okay? And ask them for ideas. Form an advisory committee. I had an advisory committee for the first number of years and then I didn't really need it. I just called and it was an as needed basis. I pick people who support the program, who will interface with it. Okay, so whoever that is, counsel, I had a counselor, I had an administrator, uh, a health teacher, I had the custodian um, and, and I had a front office staff person. And the reason is, and, and the reason I had those people on my advisory team is if you're doing, if you're doing, um, if your kids are pulling other kids out of class for one-to-one -one counseling or mediation, you, they have to know what the front office protocol is for calling kids out of class. You definitely want someone from the front office. You definitely want a custodian on your team, on your advisory team, because they're going to be hanging banners and all kinds of things around school and advertising. That most important person, like I said, I always say my first three days at any school, the site was know your custodian, day one. That's the most important person, okay? And then, of course, you want to pick someone, one person who doesn't like or approve of your program. And the reason I bring that up is having a naysayer is, and I feel like this with anything in life, if someone has a concern with whom you're interacting, 
my, I always say your concerns are my concerns and you have to mean it. So if there's a teacher, you're always pulling kids out of their class or they, they're skeptical about the wellness and, and well-being issues around and their concerns. Those would be my concerns too, because other people have them. And you would like, you know, a sort of mindset, you don't want to do something to someone or for them or ignore them. You want to work with them, the with mindset. How do we make this happen? We have this program, okay, who then, you know, we have this great program um, and you have concerns. How do we make this work? I don't want kids pulled out of my class. Okay, so do you think that we need to ask people at school who really don't want kids ever pulled out? Or is there a particular you know, class or whatever? So you get used to saying your concerns are my concerns. I encourage you to create a one-page monthly newsletter with information on what your program has accomplished, plans on doing, statistics, upcoming events. Let people uh, flood them with information. <laughs> Even though they're already flooded with information. Um, I had bright pink is the color of every piece of paper that went out of my class. <laughs> so and every t-shirt had bright pink on it. And the badges were bright. We called it, you know, uh, you know, it was pure pink. Acknowledge people's concerns. Here it is. Get used to saying your concerns and my concerns. Sponsor a faculty student discussion group. Have your students invite their teachers. Invite the administration to come sit in. Make presentations to your school board and the PTSA and do year-end report evaluation and distribute it to faculty. We actually put out one every month and then at the end of the year. And by the way, I didn't do it. It's a youth use program. My youth did it. How do we get the word out? How do we make this happen? So this is these are some ideas to get um, faculty support. And let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. So you will see here in this picture, that's the pink badges. We actually had some of my kids one year had a rock band called the Pink Badges. They uh, <laughs> wrote all kinds of music about support and help and love and kindness. So <laughs> all the uh, my rock and roll uh, students. <laughs> so that was fun. So this is um, the ingredients for a successful peer program. And this is what makes it work. There was a, um, a study done that showed what is the most important thing about um, the program. And number one came in a strong program coordinator, someone who has enough time to dedicate to the work, who has a good rapport with students, like I said, who has good boundaries, um, you know, and, and, and really knows when to learn from students, when to teach them and when to learn from them, okay? You have a good training model for students. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. You have clear program goals. Students are committed and feel ownership to the program. You get faculty support. You are supervising your students. You have, as a program coordinator, you have good contact with students. You must have a diver the diversity of students and that confidentiality rules are observed. And that's something you do on day one. I'll talk about the curriculum in a second. And then this was a tie, recruitment of students and value exploration and reflection. So I happen to teach in a style called the uh, trans, um, transformative style of teaching and learning. It's uh, Jack Mesereau's style. I didn't know that that's what it was called. I thought it was the aha method of teaching until somebody came from the Department of Education, came in my class and said, oh, you teach in the transformative style. And I said, yeah, I do. And I think I have no clue what you're talking about. So I went home and looked it up and sure enough, it was exactly that, processing every activity of what was your experience with this as a team? What are you learning from this experience? And how are you going to put this into action now that you are um, a peer advocate, as a peer advocate? Or why did I do this with you as you're training to be a peer advocate? So the, I called it ELA, um, experience learning and putting into action. So um, the next thing is student empowerment and decision making good community resources and rewards and incentives. So you'll see that strong program coordinator is top of the list. So this is, and I'll, let's go into the next slide and talk about why programs fail. So failure to involve the rest of the school or community, as I mentioned earlier, when the program coordinator leaves the program, although if you leave a solid program, which I did after 20 years and, and is still running, I remember I left teaching in 2014, Kenny still, High School has a, still has a peer program, which is really great. You know, 
we're talking almost 10 years later and it looks different, but it's still there. Um, so that's great. Not enough time for the coordinator to plan and supervise. You have over ambitious goals and you want to do everything and there's no funding at all. There's no money. That's why programs fail. I would like to just say one thing that I didn't mention earlier. When you, and I, and, and um, I, I didn't put in a slide about this, but there are two things that you, when you are actually training with the curriculum, your curriculum needs to be broken down. And what I did with this, with this curriculum was half the book is just on students' self-awareness, taking a look at their values, looking at clearing their lenses, doing things like, like um, looking at their frames of reference and coming to understand half, half the curriculum is just completely looking at what are my prejudices? What are my bigotries? Most of the, when I came into the peer program back in the late nineties, it was all communication skills training and how to present. And I realized given my own background that I needed for students to be able to clear their lenses, take a look at their biases before they actually went in to work with anybody else. And so what I, so, it's all activities based and all this kind of transformative teaching and learning where they go through activities and then they process the activities. So that's one part. And then the other side of training are four basic skills, the communication skills. What are your nonverbals? How do you ask open and closed questions to get information? Paraphrasing for content and feeling. And then finally guiding others without giving advice. So that is, it's a dual curriculum. And, and I found that what I received when I first went into this program after so many years of teaching high school and middle school, that, um, that I was only getting the communication skills, but you really have to do lens clearing work first, self-awareness work. And so that's how I put this curriculum together. So that's it. I think I've gone through everything. Let's go, um, Amy, can we do questions? Yes, so. we can. Um, we have some questions that people have put in our q and I'm gonna just read some of those out to you, if that's okay. And I encourage, we do have time um, to answer questions. So if there's something that you want Hillary to elaborate on or something that you want more details on, please go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, one of the first questions, Hillary, is about these strategies being appropriate for elementary and middle school students. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about different age groups and peer programs? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, I would, I would, if you're in middle school, I would definitely recommend um, seventh and eighth graders to be doing this work. And you can do some sixth graders, but they'd have to be very, very mature. So um, the, the curriculum that I wrote and these strategies as an educator, I taught middle school for a very brief time. Um, and I found that I had to really structure those activities in a way that were manageable for them. But as a middle school teacher or someone working with that age group, you could look at this curriculum and say, I can do that. So I also want to put a plug in for a program called Soul Shop, S-O-U-L, and Shop is the old-fashioned way, S-H-O-P-P-E. Vicki Abadesco did peer resource work. She started a program. And if you're interested in when elementary school kids doing some of this work, it's all about um, conflict, conflict mediation for that age group. And she's phenomenal. Her pro program is phenomenal. They're based in Oakland but they travel all over, so. Great, thank you. Yes, it is It is Soul Shop, someone put it in there, yes. The <laughs> whole, yes. Uh, another question is, if you could provide a little bit more information about um, conflict mediation. Absolutely, so um, yeah, so conflict mediation, I was trained by community boards of San Francisco back in um, the late 90s. So I trained up my youth and I actually had them come in and support. We did like what you learn in teacher school. I do, uh, you do, we do, I do. So that's what happened. I got trained up. We did it together then with somebody at Soul Shop. And so there is a curriculum, but I wrote a curriculum 
also in of a conflict resolution curriculum and I train up students and I train up adults um, to do conflict mediation. Let me say this though. If you want your students to be conflict mediators, they still need that basic training, the lens clearing work, the values clarification, looking at their biases, and then the communication skills. How do I ask good questions? How do I paraphrase? So I have um, conflict mediation curriculums um, that I wrote. I've actually written um, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. I didn't, my team, if you go to our website at peeradvocates.com, you'll see that we're a whole team of people that work together, but we've, we've done a lot of curriculum development for different school districts on these topics. Just know what the, um, what the uh, issues are in your district or in your community. I hope, does that answer the question for um, conflict resolution training? I hope so. I hope so, but feel free to add more questions if and, that didn't quite. And please um, feel free to contact me personally. Um, my email will be at the end of the last slide. There's another question that's specifically about high school peers mentoring middle school students. Right. And any thoughts around removing transportation barriers? Um, obviously, it's nice when the high school and middle school are a walkable distance, but that's not always the case. Would you put into the budget a bus cost, which is expensive? So if you could just talk about some of that. Yes. Those. I mean, uh, one of the things that we did was um, when, it, if it's walking distance, of course, that's great. Exactly what you're saying, Amy. One of the other things I did and what I did with the parents and you can do this with the middle school parents also, is if you get a day or a few days of your insurance to, uh, on your own car to transport students, it's really inexpensive where you can drive students. Of course, if you have a car that fits four people, you're going to want and you have a group of 12, you're going to want some parent involvement or other involvement. So it is possible paraprofessional. You may want to even make those decisions. I just paid for the insurance upgrade for the times that I took my youth to conferences and things like that. But definitely put in your budget if you know your district. I know working out in the hinterlands of um, with uh, um, um, Marin County, that it was really hard to get youth there. Um, so they had school buses from the district. It depends on your district, depends on what you're willing to put in in terms of your own insurance and getting, I had a lot of parent support, a lot of parent support in a community. And the irony was because so many of the parents were unemployed and I just paid for the upgrade in their, their um, and it was a few dollars for their insurance. So anyway, I hope that answers the question. Great. Of course, I don't know, Amy, if the funding that you're talking about also that you have available might be a resource. Yeah, so I'll just I'll just give a little sneak peek because I want to keep asking the questions and getting your your responses. But, you know, there is a fund um, funding that's coming that's going it's a pilot project. So it's only funding eight high schools to develop peer programs, but it's a pretty substantial amount of money. And it's a I think three year learning process, but um, there's gonna be a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks that's gonna give more information about how to apply for these dollars. And the hope is that really there's gonna be more statewide funding, more um, curriculus to support, more resources to help people get these programs started. So I will be sharing that information about the webinar for that funding stream um, a little later. Um, we're going, oh, and thank you. I think it just got dropped in the chat. Um, it's on the 30th of November. Um, one of our participants is just asking about curriculum or training for, I think specifically a peer-to-peer -peer counseling program. Yes, um, I am. Um, yes, uh, what about it is, I'm just wondering. Um, just, uh, if there's, I, I'm, yes. I'm, it sounds like your curriculum. This is, this is it. Is, is one of the options. <laughs> this is it. And um, it's all scaffolded, it's all um, Common Core based, it's all having to do, it's all hooked into the SEL, um, uh, um, what should, how would I put it, um, the state standards and the core social emotional learning competencies. So yes, this curriculum, um, and it also, even though it's for a full school year, it's also for a, um, it has a six hour training broken down, eight, um, 
something like 12 hours, 20, 16 hours, 22 hours. And it's absolutely appropriate for high school. It is absolutely a middle school and high school. That's what it was written for. That's what I taught. So yes, I have this, uh, this is what this curriculum is. And um, again, it, you can purchase it on Amazon. And I also have the, the actual, after you do this training, I then have the conflict mediation training that is on top of that, the step-by-step -step process of training your students in conflict mediation. Again, I wouldn't just dive into conflict mediation. They need pre-skills training, which is this book. Great. There's a couple of questions related to stipends. Um, when recruiting students, would you suggest a peer program that pays the selected peer advocate stipends with outside funding? Uh, this seems like it would remove some barriers for high school students who would typically need a job for financial resources. Absolutely. I know that Berkeley High has stipends. Um, the person that I trained over at Berkeley High, um, her, her youth gets stipends. Absolutely. Whatever works. I don't, I, I will not tell you, you know your population. You know your group. Absolutely. If there's a way to, to, to cut out be excluded, like to get rid of excluding people, absolutely use it. I encourage you. Include as many young people as you can from every walk of life, every social group. So also make sure if your district has or has a, um, um, what is it called, community service or um, I forget what the, the word is in education. I used to run that program where you got, you had to have community service hours to graduate. There's also that possibility. So um, all, kind, all kinds of possibilities. Um, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Do great, it. Great. Uh, th this question, I think you've sort of answered, but I'm gonna ask it again. Someone's asking about the curriculum or training. Should they be customized? Or, and do you have a list of programs or curriculum? Um, do I have a list of pro? I have, of course, my curriculum, which I took and drew out of many different curricula. I have other curricula that I can give you and that I can suggest. Um, it's it again, customized. I'm thinking that you would, depending on the school environment and the needs, you would be kind of shaping from what. You absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, um, and thank you, Jill um, Berticelli, <laughs> so she's been using the curriculum for five years. I'm sorry. I just saw that. I got distracted and, and it's been great. So, um, yes, I, I have a lot of curriculum, um, but I found that some of it was lacking in terms of um, in terms of clearing lenses. So I that's why I wrote the curriculum. I also have a list and I can share that with you, Amy, to send out to everybody also a list of um, of uh, icebreaker books that I found to be the best. Um, you can find the curriculum on Amazon and I'll put that up. The name of it is the next slide. So um, yeah, and, and Mar it has been put in the chat. So um, you can, oh, there it is again. Thank you to our person behind the scenes for getting that information out. Um, also this question I've heard uh, many times and someone has put it in the chat in terms of liability and concerns around, you know, if something were to happen, some a student that disclosed something, can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, you have to make a decision. I mean, my first, you know, here I am, I've been a, a seasoned educator. Um, I've been teaching for years and years and years. Um, and I, I started the peer program the first, the first year I chose my students. I, I did that. After that, my students interviewed other students. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get involved. I could recommend kids to interview, but I didn't. And remember also, by the way, your selection process has to be inclusive of all people. If they have to fill out a, a form in a high stress environment, you may find that kids won't do it because they're totally stressed. Or if they're students who, who, aren't, who don't write or read well. So always remember that your selection process also has to be very inclusive. So we had an interview process. And that, so first year I chose my students, sent them to the CAP conference in LA and I'm in Oakland and the school is in Fremont. And what do they do? They go ahead and they smoke pot. And, and of course they get caught. And of course somebody's got from the conference has to bring them home. Well, the rest of the students and these kids, these four kids got picked out their names out of a hat to go. The rest of the team was really upset that they had this opportunity and they blew it. So 
I called Ira, who was my mentor. What do I do? And he said, what do you think you want to do? And for me, it was no student is throw away. I don't believe in throwing kids away. Um, and not, it wasn't even restorative practices time, but that's how I ran my classroom. I said, I think you need to sit down and have a, a meeting with your team. And so they, there were reparations made. Okay. They were, they, they were reparations made to these students, um, the rest of the peers. So it depends. Students will do things that, um, that will break lots of rules. They're teenagers. There, um, there are times I've asked students to leave the program or they can, they can say, I don't want this. This is for me at a certain point they can pull out, but, um, reframe the question, Amy. Well, I guess another thing way to look, oh, if you could talk a little bit more about the issues around confidentiality okay, and also yeah. reporting duty to inform if right. the, another student disclosed something that okay. certainly was not something that that young person yes. should be able to handle or, you know. Well, so when we had one situation where confidentiality is the first thing you talk about on day one with your students and, and they're, you know, we discuss mandated reporting, I call it duties to inform and that every day, and it, actually in the book, it's, it's in the first few lessons, it's day one, you repeat it all the time about confidentiality, except for the reasons to break confidentiality. Now we had a situation where a student did break confidentiality and it became a situation where and the kids understand because they're part of something bigger than themselves. They don't want to break confidentiality. They know the discussion around this is what does it feel like when someone breaks confidentiality? What is, you know, they talk about betrayal and they talk about what if someone broke confidentiality in the program? They talk about, you know, that we won't have faith in the program. What you do impacts all of us. So when one student did break confidentiality and it happened to be, to another peer, one peer to another peer, we had a circle and there were reparations made around that. The kids decided to pull his badge for a month. Um, so, you know, that he couldn't, he couldn't do the work in the peer program. He was pretty devastated. He got a big lesson, but that came and he, they also understood why he had done it. They got, they could hear him. They could see it, why he did it. So, this the very last lesson actually in, in the book is about are you in over your head and where kids have to if it's a duty to inform issue it's really hot and they must go get some help so there it is really scaffolded in a way where students say oh this is really this is a big issue and when you're planting when they're doing role plays around counseling you're planting duty to inform issues and you want them to note them and you're teaching them how to deal with a, a duty to inform issue. Like if it's the end of the school day, you may be up and going right then and there because you don't want to send that kid home to an abusive family. Or, you know, you will be teaching them these things as opposed to if it's first period and it's something that can be dealt with during the day. So um, there, there's also a, um, a uh, um, code of ethics that they sign there are norms and rules. So you have to decide what works for you. You know, I've had teachers come to me and said, you have that kid in your class. He never comes to my class. And it's like, well, he's coming to mine and he's really a phenomenal peer advocate, you know? So you're going to get a lot of naysayers too. I don't know. Does that answer the question? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's also something that I've heard that administrators have concerns about peer programs because of you know, potential uh, issues where there's duty to inform and the young person doesn't. But it, it, to me, that seems like it's a, a training issue. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I agree. And that your programs have to really ensure that kids understand about confidentiality and the implications absolutely. and understand about duty and to inform. And they absolutely. know the boundaries and the scope of their role and when yeah. they need to call into an adult. Absolutely. And that, that is reviewed and reviewed and reviewed all through the year yeah. or all through the training. That's right. why you people rise to the level of the training, kids with eight hours of training, this is not going, I would not put them in a peer counseling situation. Right, right. Just as you said, people rise to the level of their training, right. but we yeah. can't expect them to right. 
be prepared for something they haven't been trained for. Right, exactly. All right, okay. um, a couple more questions that have come in. What traits or qualifications do you look for in a program coordinator or who, the teacher who's gonna run the peer program? Um, I have um, I have a whole list of things. Somebody who has enough time to commit, somebody who has a really big heart and really gets kids, um, somebody who has good boundaries, um, somebody you know who just has a, a view onto mental health issues and social emotional learning and values that in students. So those are the kinds of things. I can also send the list of other traits that um that I that I think are important mm -hmm. but that would be that's pretty much the basic um view I'm trying to look for if I can have that list right in front of me right now um I don't so yeah, if you want to share that we can we can share it out to our, our okay I'll, I'll do all that I'll do all that great uh okay this is a kind of a specific question um if an FQHC, a federally qualified health center, and an LEA, a local education agency, are working together, would you have any specific suggestions for delineating the work for the FQHC behavioral health team and the school team um, working together to support um, peer uh, um, advocates or ambassadors? Okay, I don't know these names, so give that to me again. I I would say that the question is really partners, partnerships between schools and community-based organizations or that are other organizations that are providing services on campus and, and sort of how to delineate roles for them to work well together to support a program. Um, it's really, it's again, it's like the whole mindset of restorative mindset with anything. How do you work with others given what your specific skills are? I would think it would be, um, if you, you know, a community of purpose is one in which you collaborate, cooperate, um, and communicate towards common goals. So if you have, if you have two organizations, two CBOs, two organizations outside of schools that are working together, I would suggest to come together and come up with a plan and approach a school for the local schools and speak to the administration there about what you'd like to see happen or what are their SEL, what are their social emotional learning plans, you know, what is their funding that you can offer services. Um, but I would definitely have that have that conversation first before you go in with your other community based organization. How can we support each other? What will our roles be? That kind of thing. I always think about with that's how my team works. You know, how do we work with each other, different styles, even or I we do this, well, we do that too. how to make we make this work. So that's the real collaboration. And it, yeah, often we suggest like making sure that you're having regular check-ins between right. partners, putting things in writing of who's doing which role exactly. um, and, you know, doing the problem solving as you go, because inevitably there are challenges, misunderstandings that need, that can be worked through. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to be willing. You have to be, have a growth mindset okay. in that we can work this out. Not right. a stuck, not a stuck mindset. Great. I think there's maybe just another question that I missed that was in the chat. Um, someone asking, do you provide training for advisors um, to train staff themselves or just train students? So um, I, I can, I'll say this. Um, one of the things that I really believe in is lived experience. So if you haven't run a peer program, I don't advise training um, are you saying to train other advisors or other coordinators? I think the question is asking, do you, Hillary, provide training for for folks that might oh. be starting a program? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's what I do. Um, that's I, I just came out of um, El Dorado County Office of Ed, out of, um, yes, I offer a ton of programs of support. I love public education. I love community organizations. Education is my jam. Uh, <laughs> I just, yes, it's exactly what I do. I go into schools, into districts, into um, departments of education. I'm working with, with, um, with uh, Stockton Unified. I'm working with Antioch. I'm working with Ventura County. We're working with um, 
you know, just uh, uh, Salinas, everywhere. Stockton, just rolling out peer programs everywhere. That's what that's what I love to do. And this might yes. be a good time for me to interject about the peer learning community that we will be launching and that Hillary will be leading for um, with school, uh, the California School Based Health Alliance that will start in February. And this will be a, a deeper dive um, than what we've done today. It will be four sessions that are going to be three hours long. It's going to be a small cohort um, of folks who are really ready. We're really ready to dig in and to start visioning and planning and implementing a peer program at your site or uplifting the one that you have. So we will be releasing information about that cohort um, in December. We don't have that yet. And we will have a, a, a very simple application process because we're only going to accept a limited number into that um, deeper four session uh, learning around peer programs. But we're really excited that Hillary is going to be leading that for us. Um, so more to come on that. And we'd love any of you who are interested to, to uh, let us know and we can hopefully include you. Um, if there's no more questions, I'm going to go on to our final slides. That's okay. Let me... This is, uh, we've shared in the chat how you can reach Hillary, but again, here's her information, her website, and her book that is available to you, um, very detailed and has really been used by lots of folks um, to grow their peer programs. She's got deep expertise and it's in that book. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, some upcoming opportunities. The Peer-to-Peer -peer Learning Collaborative that I just spoke of will be February and March, um, and more information coming in December. So keep an eye out for that. We'll definitely be sending the information out to you if you've signed up for this webinar. Um, we also are um, planning a youth-led webinar where we're bringing youth who are in who are peer leaders right now uh, doing this work to share with, with all of us, with adults who do this work um, about what, what it means to them, what's meaningful, what have they learned, what is it, what model are they using, what it's looked like at their school. So we're really excited about that. You'll hear from probably three to four different programs and that will be the first week of February and we're just working on confirming that date. So please join us for that. It's always powerful to hear from the mouths of our young people what being a, a peer leader has been for them. And then we, we are also hosting in two weeks a wellness coach um, webinar. And this, if you're not familiar, wellness coaches is a, one of the initiatives of CYBHI, the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. Um, and we have someone from the state who's gonna come and talk about that program, but it really is an opportunity to have more support for non-clinical mental health interventions, which peer-to-peer -peer is definitely a non-clinical support program. And so we're excited to be able to share what is coming. This is not yet a thing. Wellness Coaches is in the, in the works, but it is coming as of 2025. So it's a great time to learn about it. Um, and we have that information in the chat right now for you if you wanna sign up for that webinar. Um, and then I mentioned the funding. We, um, part of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health, Health Initiative is a $8 million pilot project to really focus on eight high schools to bring um, peer, peer to peer programs. And it is going to be an, uh, a learning process, but also a real opportunity to, to get substantive funding to start a program, to have adequate staffing, to really, um, uh, have come from a place of a little bit more abundance than we often are starting programs with, you know, a shoestring. So I encourage you to join us for the webinar that's going to explain this um, funding and how you apply for it. I believe that the RFP will be released in January, in early January, and then it will be funded. They will make their decision by um, April, May to start next school year. So 
it's a really great rare opportunity to actually get some substantive funding. Um, again, it's only eight schools that are going to get funded, but it could be one of the schools where you work. So please keep an eye on that. Um, and you know, Hillary, I didn't want want to cut you off, but are there any final words that you'd like to share before we close? Um, just it, it, this is kind of life changing work, not just for your youth, but for I know it was for me. I I I am um, I was a special ed teacher working with teens with serious emotional issues, teens with you know, um drug and alcohol abuse substance issues teens who had been adjudicated by the courts to be in programs group homes you know and i was a resource specialist for 10 years and um i it, it, this is it's life-changing it's relationships with youth that you won't have in any other way um because you really get to know these students but mostly you know um there's so many things that i have a sign i'm looking in my home office th that um you know, we know as people who work in agencies and schools that we're often not invited to the table. And then, you know, we're on the menu when you're not invited to the table. But the truth is you cannot do the work to help youth without youth helping to do the work. And um, I'm really, I'm a total proponent of a peer-to-peer -peer program. So, um, and, you know, we often look at youth as the pr problem, but they have the answers to the problems if you just would ask and listen. So um, anyway, I, I do a lot of trainings. Look at my my website, but also, you know, um, we do a lot of LGBTQI plus training. We do this training for wellness coordinators, students who are working in wellness centers. We do trauma resilience training of those youth and actually the adults to train the youth. Uh, we have this curriculum. We, we do um, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging trainings for youth and also for the adults. But this will be on top of the basic training so that if they are working in wellness centers, or they are working in other places, they have the tools to cope with some of these things. How to interview somebody who's coming into a wellness center or coming, you know, those kinds of things. And people who have those lived experiences are on my team. Um, um, you know, that's, um, it's very important in, in my purview that, that, uh, like the same thing, you can't do the work to help, you know, LGBTQI plus community without uh, those folks doing the work. So that's, I'm committed to that. Um, and I just saw there's one last question that I did not see, but it's sort of related to what you were just talking about. Um, have you done this in community day schools, absolutely. continuation high schools, alternative schools? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, the, the every every high school in Fremont had the program five a uh, five um, comprehensive high schools and one continuation school, and the two programs that were the most successful were mine, which was a you know kind of, you know like you know the most challenged high school in the district and the continuation high school, and I have a resource for that fellow who who ran that program. He's willing to work with anybody. Absolutely, done this. And especially community schools, absolutely. What an opportunity for the kids who have been most challenged by what's going on to support each other. So much growth. By the way, your youth also, you know, if they want to go to college, in junior college even, they have they have on the junior college campus something called the ambassador program. The first year they not they get trained to give tours and things like that. After that, they get paid. But the peers who went on to do that work at the junior college were, were better trained than the kids who got trained at, at the junior college level. They had more experience. Also, the same thing with CSUs and UCs. You want to be a resident assistant? This is a great thing. Also, you get your, your, your tuition, your um, housing paid for. So these are the kinds of th things that are such, we I see so many youth going into this work. In fact, the book was edited down to fewer um, fewer lessons by two of my former students, one of whom is now um, at, at Alameda County Office of Ed as a 2 p coordinator, and another one is working at Seneca as a, as a um, LCSW. But they were two of my students who after high school took the book and said, these are the most important lessons. So you're going to find your youth going on to do work, even if they end up in business or working in a garage or whatever, 
their their people skills will be enhanced completely. So anyway, I'm looking at look at these nice high Yeah, we're getting some really nice, <laughs> nice kudos in the chat. So please we'll read those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to just say another thank you to everyone. As you log off, there's a really brief evaluation. We are really grateful to you for taking another moment to give us your feedback about um, this webinar. And again, you should expect an email from us in the next few days. Um, please reach out to us for anything, to Hillary, to myself. We will be um, happy to, to help you. We really wanna support these programs to grow and thrive. So thank you everyone.